information. So my name is uh, Shane Oley. I am the uh, race director of the Cape Breath Ultra and the Montaigne Dragon's Back race. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, I am here this evening with my colleague Eleanor. So Eleanor's just right Hello. here. So Eleanor is going to help answer um, questions and deal with uh, Q&A and chat. So uh, what should be happening is that you should be able to hear me um, and see me and the same for Ellie and Paul, who we're going to chat with this evening. We can't see any of you and we can't hear any of you, um, but we can see um, uh, the chat going on. So if you have any questions, um, please put them in the Q&A. Um, and perhaps if you have any chat, like we'd be really keen to know whether you're thinking about uh, taking part in the Dragon's Back race or Cape Wrath Ultra, just uh, stick that in the chat and um, get to know each other. So I will probably every now and then have a little aside with um, Eleanor. Yeah. Um, do you want to make sure you admit anybody? Can you see? Yeah, that? I okay. will just have a look now. Right. So I'm going to focus um, uh, on talking with Paul and Ellie. So first of all, I would like to say thank you very much for offering to come and chat with everybody this evening and share your experiences. Um, Paul took part in the Cape Wrath Ultra this year and Ellie took part in the Dragon's Back race. So we've got two um, uh, different perspectives to um, to share with you. So Paul, why don't, why don't you tell us first of all in in a few words kind of what what attracted you to take part in the Cape Wrath Ultra? Um, so I guess it was an opportune moment and uh, and quite fortunately for you it was one of your events as well so it was up at the uh, Kinloch Leven Skyline Scotland so it's the year before so it was 2021 and uh, I was up there for I think I was actually just spectating that year and uh, and quite cleverly, you'd put a big advert for uh, Cape Wrath Ultra on, on the big um, big billboard. Uh, so when I was standing at the finish line watching people come in, and I ended up watching this, this screen, and it was all the highlights from from a previous year. And I was just like, that looks that looks amazing. So um, so literally just went on, and I was like on my phone just googling it. And then once I got over the sort of the cost of it, I was like. Right, but is this something I would actually really want to do? And um, me and my partner just kind of sat really for like twenty minutes, just chatting about it. And I was like, because I'm a, I'm a bit of like a I need to just if I if I see something, I'm I'm quite um you know I can, I can just go for it. So um and I so I just decided to to book it there and then. So. Brilliant. And then and then think about it afterwards. <laughs> OK, OK. So, Ellie, did you did you have a more considered decision or were you as spontaneous as Paul? Uh, no, slightly more lengthy, actually. I think I probably became aware of the race or I think it was an, a Shaf from a you know, Sheffield Adventure Film Festival film way back in probably about well, it must be one of the early days. So 2012, 2013, something like that. So long, long time ago. And that piqued my interest, but I'd done nothing, obviously, remotely similar at that stage and I had young children. And so 10 years later, uh, finally sort of got round to, um, well, in 2021, volunteered. And, and then kind of that really made my mind up that, yeah, I'm definitely really, really up for it. And um, so, yeah, it's been rumbling along for a very long time, but finally decided I might be capable. <laughs> Excellent. So I'm going to jump down one of those rabbit holes straight away because you said um, you volunteered. Um, so it strikes me that a very good way to understand the event beforehand, kind of see it from the inside, is to volunteer. So how did that help with your preparation? Oh, it's, yeah, really, really great to see it from the other side. Um, yeah, just you get such a good bit of inside information, chatting to the runners that are doing the event and also um you know just seeing what, what happens at camp and you know putting I was on the camp teams so I was there putting up the tents and carrying bags and things which again yeah good opportunity to chat to people but just see it from the other side and really try and understand how that camp life works because there's quite a lot to that um that can I think improve your chances in the race if you've got a good handle on the camp admin side. We are definitely going to jump into camp admin in a moment um but I, I'm kind of so that 
our um, viewers, I guess, get an understanding of how your preparation and where you were beforehand. I'm going to ask you both, and I'll start with Paul. Um, kind of where were you in terms of your your running at the point where you signed up? How much running had you done before? Where you well, you you tell us. <laughs> yeah, well, I get. I mean, I get. I guess that's what made it. Um, I, I could just do it as a spur of the moment thing because I was at a pretty high level of. Uh, training and running and fitness so that something when I'm you know seeing something that advertises a 400k run I was thinking oh that sounds fun you know so um, I mean I suppose I you know I'd done my first ultra marathon maybe nine years before that so um, so I built and building up to that so over, you know over the course of the last 10 years I guess um, you know I just upped my running from ultras back to back things and uh i suppose doing less um less races and just more adventures out by myself which i, I think is why the cape wrath also you know also kind of appealed because it was like you just saw as, well as advertised it's an expedition sort of thing you know it's you're not feeling like you're entering into a high pressure race to compete against people um even just the nature of it you know the kind of staggered starts in the morning you don't you know you're kind of just out there having your own having your own adventure so uh so yeah i wasn't i, I mean i still had to up my training quite a bit um and i, and I after now doing it i probably could have upped it even more because yeah I, I was even surprised at how how hard i think it actually was so yeah i, th I think i had a, had a fairly decent level of fitness at, at that point OK, and I guess same question to you, Ellie, kind of at that point when you decided to enter, where where would you have gauged your kind of Yeah, I think when I actually entered that year before the race, um, I, I wasn't particularly running fit at all. I struggled. I really found the lockdowns difficult to get out and do much training. So um, I just wasn't in a yeah particularly brilliant place kind of mentally. So, yeah, I hadn't done that much running at that point, but obviously in previous years i'd done the gl3d quite um probably three or four times previously um had quite a bit of mountain you know mountain running experience and mountain marathons and um you know mountain walking um so i wouldn't say i was massively running fit at the point i entered but i had previous experience that i kind of knew that i could handle being in the mountains yeah. and running for long days and stuff like that OK, so I think I'm going to do a little plug for our other event, which is the Scarpa Great Lakeland three day, otherwise known as the GL3D. It's um, been going to, oh, well, 25 years nearly now, um, not originally organised by us at Area Events, but it's got a long, long heritage of Lakeland fell and trail running. And it's a brilliant measure for where you're at if you're thinking of doing one of these expedition races you can come and do three days at the gl3d and there's many similarities it's it is easier um and there's lots of different course lengths and choices you get a bar at the overnight camp there's some luxuries for sure um but it does give you a kind of a, a step into that door of multi-day kind of expedition racing so it's a it's definitely a good one to do um so i'm gonna i'm gonna ask you both um Maybe I'll start with Ellie because you you'd been at the Dragon's Back as a volunteer. But again, when you were in, once you decided to enter, what was your biggest kind of concern, the uncertainty that you might have had beforehand? Um, yeah, I mean, obviously, you know, everybody is concerned about their fitness. But for me, in thinking about the year leading up, it's just thinking about how am I going to fit in enough training and the rec and the reccees in particular. I live in Lincolnshire. It's pretty pancake flat so I knew I had to get out to the mountains um probably still didn't do enough of that but you know did some good reckeys recce uh pretty much every day apart from well or didn't manage all of five and didn't do any of six but um yeah did some good reckeys and so that was my concern really was that kind of um I'm, how am I going to fit it in around family life um yeah that's the main thing I think and and same for you, Paul. How, what were your kind of concerns before the event? Um, so, I mean, as as somebody that tends to overthink pretty much everything I do, um, that having quite a bit of time to think about what I was going to pack and the logistics of um, where we're going to stay and and all of that was a, a bit of a nightmare. Probably, you know, 
in once I actually knuckled down to the week before, I was like, right, now I actually have to start putting together and realizing what's going to fit into this dry bag, which seems huge at first. And then you like you put in half your stuff and it's full and you're thinking, eh, you know. So I think I yeah, probably just overthinking things like, you know, all your energy and what clothes you're going to wear and then down to like even you just go well what shorts will I wear? what shorts will I wear on the first day and then shoes will I take these shoes and I, and I have um way too many pairs of shoes as some people might have seen recently on Facebook um <laughs> uh so yeah the all those things kind of occupy my mind on the on the side of that I'm also training as well but I suppose that I just enjoy the training and I you know I don't see it as training as such I just go out running and uh, so it was more, yeah, it was more just all that sort of, um, you know, getting all your kit ready thing yeah. that probably stressed me out the most. So seeing as we're talking about kit, um, the phrase that we often use um, uh, about the event is your, your personal admin and your ability to kind of look after yourself in the tents and be organised with your kit. Um, Ellie, I mean, I, I guess, why don't you tell us about your approach to kind of personal admin at, at the event? OK, so I'd seen from, you know, volunteering, that you know, the people who sort of did well or made life easy for themselves um, were just super well organised. Um, so that was my kind of plan was just to try not to have a complete kit explosion every night in the tent. So have things really well organised from the dry bag, but in other bags, have things labelled. Um, have um you know maybe a, a grab bag for when you get to camp that kind of thing so um just to get really super organized because it's for me especially I was knew I'd be getting in it'd be pretty much either dark or nearly dark when I got in um so just anything you can do to make life easier for yourself by being organized um rather than just having kind of everything all over the place I mean it still ended up a little bit that way but certainly started off <laughs> with good intentions <laughs> and and Paul, what was your approach to kind of camp life and personal admin? Yeah, I think, well, I mean, after talking about deciding for so long about what kit to take, um, I didn't wear half of it. Like, and I wish I had maybe just, to, especially with the weather conditions we end up having for Cape Wrath this year, um, I wish I'd taken more, war, you know, warmer clothes and stuff for the camp. Um, less so much for actually what I was going to wear when I was running because you you just, I mean, I think I wore the same pair of shorts for the first four days, like, and I had taken a, a spare pair of shorts for every day. So, you know, same with t-shirts and things like that, because especially with the conditions, you just went out and you you got wet anyway. It didn't it didn't really matter. Um, but one, there was a a few things certainly within the camp that helped was, um, you know, because you you've got to have all your plates and cutlery and washing up stuff. So I just had that in one of those kind of drawstring bags, uh, so you could just grab that. As soon as you arrive, had that right at the top of my drop bag, you know, because you could just go straight in, pull that out, put it on your back, and then go around to the catering tent, do it, you know, and you just had it there. I, I would just have that on my back the whole the whole night, you know. So at any point I could go, oh, I'm feeling a bit hungry again, I'll just knit back rounds. So um I right, so that that definitely helped. Yeah. Yeah, I think I've seen that with um participants who have probably on average been more successful is that ability to be organised at the camp and have things like their their food and um, you know plates and cutlery like immediately available for when they finish, so that they can get straight in and have chips. Chips are always some um, popular. <laughs> um, okay, so um, I guess I always when I think about preparing for these races, these long long races. Um, I think it's really important to focus on the journey and the process and actually the real the real value is often not necessarily in doing the event but all of the the highs and lows of the journey preparing for the event and inevitably if you do you know 12 months of preparation which is common for most people you know you'll pick up injuries and niggles or you'll have other challenges that you didn't anticipate so again let's let's stick with paul so i'll come to you same question in a moment ellie but tell us about your your 12 month journey paul building up was there any challenges along the way um not really. as i said I, I tend to look more as the training of just 
uh, going out and enjoying running. But I suppose just a bit more focused on building up the volume so that, you know, I was up to sort of 150, 160 K weeks um, and mostly trail running and trying to get in decent elevation. Um, you, know, be, you know, living in Scotland, doing trails, you know, I wasn't so concerned about what the actual terrain was going to be. Um, so I was quite surprised actually as to how, uh, what it was actually, or I, I guess the the volume of rough terrain that was out there um, was uh, was pretty hard. So, but I, um, just about six weeks before Cape Wrath, I had set myself a target. I wanted to try, I hadn't run a hundred k in a in a winter, so uh, headed out for just over a weekend up onto the West Island Way and did um, Fort William. Uh, did Mogai up to uh, the King's House, which was just short of 120k, which um, mm. been the biggest distance I'd run, kind of broke me a bit and uh, had a few niggle, yeah, a bit, bit more than niggly injuries to my Achilles and um, my knee, which I ended up going for MRI scans and stuff for, which uh, even right up to the week before Cape Wrath was a concern that I'd maybe just overcooked, overcooked it a bit, you know, doing something like that, which wasn't, it wasn't part of a race, it wasn't an organised thing. Um, unfortunately, I got away with it. Uh, but yeah, I guess, yeah, that was that was probably the only thing that I would have m- maybe done slightly different. Yeah. Sure, sure. And um, same question for you, Ellie, how was your kind of build up to the race? Yeah, similar, I, I guess it's just kept having, well, it never felt like any month was consistent. <laughs> I seem to always have some kind of niggle or injury going on. So, yeah, lots of money spent on physios and <laughs> massages and whatnot. Um, I think the best thing for me was planning in uh, recce's and events leading up. So obviously I did the GL3 again. Um, that was a great confidence boost. And I did um, a Brecon Beacons sort of mountain marathon as well. So that was really good prep for the terrain that we were going to be on. Um, But yeah, just managing those niggles and injuries um, was quite tricky, especially as that, you know, that volume of training starts to build up. up. Um, Yeah, and it just plays on your mind all the time. I was so worried about kind of not making it to the start line, but, um, you know, or, or, you know, not being sort of injury free. Um, So I had a super long taper because I'd really sore knees um, in the last sort of couple of months leading up. So decided just to take extra time off and I think that was probably the right thing in the end but um, yeah yeah just trying to manage those niggles get to the start as as injury free as possible I think one of my experiences from kind of racing and training is it's always better to get to the start line under prepared rather than over trained um, but it's so hard to get that judgment right and the, I think the natural inclination of anyone who likes to run is to is to run more um, so yeah challenging so i'm gonna ask about um any particular strategies you had to help you get through the race so i'll I'll jump back to paul and was there anything that you kind of planned in advance or maybe you kind of learned along the way that helped you through the through the cape wrath ultra not not really initially you know i didn't go in with any sort of race strategy as i said i looked on it more as just a big adventure and uh you know, it was quite good. You teamed up with some some good people and and ran with uh, ran with a few a few different people along the way. But um, what probably I found helped me as I went along was that um, by starting a wee bit later um, and being a bit of a faster runner, it was it it was great to be able to kind of catch up to people and and even just. You know, not, not from like the point of view of like catching people and overtaking, but like you would get a bit of chat along the way. You know, you you come along, oh hi guy, you know, and you would you know get a bit of chat and then right, you know, push on and then uh, see who else you can catch up with. Um, and that worked most most times, apart from day six. We might talk about that later. <laughs> okay, <laughs> we'll we'll ask you about day six later. Yeah, before, um, few hours before I caught anybody up. <laughs> so um, I, I'm, I'm sure you noticed, Paul, that on, on the race numbers that go on people's rucksacks, they actually have, I'm just thinking, we definitely have those at Dragon's Back. We have them at Cape Wrath, don't we? Can you remember? Does that, uh, does that ring a bell for you, Paul? The, on the back of people? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, you, uh, yes, 
you did say. yeah yep. sorry that's good i'm just checking myself then but anyway just a little bit of innovation sure. well. so um way way back at the 2012 the very first dragons back um my friend jim mann who took part that year said to me oh wouldn't it be great if you could put people's names on the little race numbers when you approach them from behind so that you can always go oh hiya and you can go oh hi Paul hi Ellie as you <laughs> and so that's what we did and it's been really good for like just building that um, almost instant community interaction because whenever you pass somebody you always know what their name is as you get to them anyhow yeah. Ellie I'm, I'm digressing can you can you tell just us about um oh, sorry, sorry you... just, just on the point the thing yeah you had the name but most importantly for me on the wee number was actually the nationality ah, because okay. Yeah, you'd get a different chat from different nationalities, and sometimes you think somebody might have been rude, but actually they just don't, didn't understand what you're talking about. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay, cool. Well, yeah, we do for, for people who haven't taken part on your race number is your nationality, your country flag, and your name, and it doesn't matter. You have one for your front, one for the back. So as people pass and you pass people, you can always kind of chat to them very easily. So Ellie, I'm um, kind of same same question to you, really. Yeah, it is a strategy. I guess I just had the plan that, well, two things. I wanted to enjoy the journey. I thought this has been such a long time coming. I've wanted to do this event for so, so long. Whatever happens, I'm just going to enjoy the, the travelling and the journey from, you know, north to south. That's really, that was really important for me. Um, and then in terms of kind of strategy for the event, um, I wanted to start early, as early as I could every day. So beyond that start line, ready to go at six o'clock. So again, trying to be organised and make sure I was there early because I knew, I, you know, I was going to be towards the back of the pack. So yeah, I wanted all the time I could get, and then just keep moving. That was my plan: was just don't faff about and don't stop. Um, obviously, there's the bag stations. I'm sure you'll perhaps come onto that, but um, you know, but stop for sort of minimal time and just mm. yeah, do what you need to do, but but try to keep moving all the time because, yeah, you can just waste so much time if you faff about, especially as the more tired you get, the more you start to faff. So, yeah, it seemed to work. So, yeah, keep moving. Yeah, I think we'll we'll um, we'll just jump back into the support points. So um, this is something that's different between Cape Wrath and Dragon's Back. So at Cape Wrath, there are no support points there's no kind of additional help each day and often the the route doesn't even cross a road for the whole day it's, it's quite remote um on the dragon's back though we always have a, a support point which is roughly halfway each day and participants can bring um or we transport for participants a small bag where they can get kit and access maybe some extra food or something like that um I've been amazed and others have been amazed. Ellie's just said it herself at how long people will spend at that support point. Um, and I mean, Ellie, perhaps you could talk just specifically about your what you witness at the support point and, and your sense of whether those are good things or bad things. <laughs> <laughs> well, when you come in, I, I found that the support point guys were brilliant, actually, in trying to keep everybody moving and stop people kind of hanging around. So almost to the point that you feel a little bit rushed and under pressure but I think you do need that because the the temptation is just to sit down and start faffing about I mean every day every time I got in um I had my water bottles pretty much you know you sort of learn as you go along but have your water bottles ready to be out and ready to be filled um and then you get your bag and you get in it and I tended to sort of be eating and trying to sort my feet out at the same time and then restocking food on on your bags on your you know run pack Mm -hmm. um, and then yeah try and get some food down um, perhaps something a bit different from what you carry in your run pack um, and um, and then yeah get out of there quickly but yeah you, there's people lying all over the place sort of sorting their feet out and having a rest and yeah 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 and I mean the guys one day I was definitely a bit more tired and slow and the guys at the support point were like come on you know don't stop keep going I can <laughs> you can see it in your face like get going yeah. give you a bit of a kick but you need it yeah you need it. yeah they do they do an amazing job the crew who work on that support point there's a, a few strong characters to get people moving along so one of the things ellie just mentioned was about um the water so this is a difference between dragon's back and cape wrath so i'll come to paul with a question here um at, at the dragon's back there is a support point where we provide potable water so drinking water 
And there's also a water point at some point during the day. Um, we do that because some parts of the Dragon's Back race are go through agricultural land and there's less opportunity to get uh, potable water from natural water sources. Cape Wrath is very different. So you see very few people or animals anywhere on the course and you need to be self-sufficient with your water throughout the day. So, Paul, maybe to go down one of those rabbit holes, can you tell us about your approach to water? We, yeah, again, fortunately, this year we didn't really have a problem with any uh, lack of water. You could just you could literally <laughs> just run with it open and like, you, were, you were hydrated. Um, there were still sections where you, you would realise that you're running low on water and you might be going up quite a um, bit of a hill and there's not much running running water about but you were never too far away from it so um, yeah really I just had water bladder in the back which I would just sip away at that would last me all day um, topped up with then just bladders just a soft flask in the front uh, and literally any time I saw a decent enough fast flowing stream you know just in and just give a good uh, few mouthfuls of that so yeah we were um, yeah it wasn't it wasn't a problem trying to stay hydrated on it so i think what i'll do just for our international participants something that is um kind of unusual i guess particularly for potential runners uh, coming from north america is in the uk generally speaking the water from the kind of mountain streams and rivers is safe to drink um you need to use a little bit of common sense you know if you can see the the water the river stream is just flowed through some fields with um, sheep or cow cows in you wouldn't want to drink that um, but generally speaking when you're away from all kinds of habitation the, the water's safe to drink and um, yeah I've been running for decades in the mountains and drink the water pretty much without much thought and have uh, generally been absolutely fine <laughs> so I'm gonna I'm gonna move on to a next question we've had oh, a few questions okay. come in about training yeah. um, Specifically, if either of you followed a structured training schedule or if either of you used a coach? OK, that's a great question. Um, so I'll just repeat the question in case um, uh, Ellie or Paul didn't hear that. So maybe we'll jump to Ellie first. So did you follow a structured training programme or did you have a coach? Uh, no, <laughs> I just had my own plan, um, which was basically to yeah keep building up the volume and um, and get the recce's recce, well sort of spread out recce weekends with increasing kind of longer runs. Typically, they've asked uh, how many miles a week. I'm okay, so approximately. Ellie, maybe you'd like to talk about the mileage kilometers you built up um, as well, if you know. Yeah. That. So I basically just threw out, tried to keep you know a long run in. So initially, a long run just did regular long runs at the weekend of kind of eighteen to twenty miles. And um, that's sort of low when I was local here. Um, and then obviously other kind of you know runs. If I couldn't, a uh, few times couldn't run because uh, of various niggles. So I just did lots of walking um, and sort of strength training a couple of times a week as well. Um, but yeah, I, 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 know, I never did like huge, huge long runs other than kind of on, on the recce days, really. Um, again, mainly because of just trying to manage injuries and niggles. So... I didn't I didn't cope very well with enormous volume. Right, right. And Paul, same same question to you, your approach to uh, training, coaching, mileage. Yeah, so I'm not a particular coach. I did start with a, a running, a hill running team, the Shettleston Harriers last year, which, uh, which is good. It just gave a, a few days, two days a week of actual proper um, proper training, not just going out and run, you know, actual intervals or hill sprints and stuff like that. So that was, so that certainly helped. Um, and, um, and other than that, yeah, it was just building up, as as Ellie was saying, just really building on your mileage week on week. Um, and just, yeah, just keep on pushing yourself to, uh, to keep going and, and build up that volume. OK, I think what I will do, um, so I, I'm going to talk about um, Missing Link Coaching, who are our training kind of coaching partner for the Dragon's Back race. Um, Trail Running Scotland, who are doing a similar service, uh, recceing and coaching for the Cape Wrath Ultra in Scotland. And then Raw Adventure, 
who do organize all of the recce weekends for the Dragon's Back race. And um, those three organizations provide a really brilliant and expert service for um, people who want to have a bit of help to get themselves ready. And I think um, the, the recce weekends um, or the re any wrecking you can do of either the Kate Rath or Dragon's Back course is, is really useful. And um, one of my uh, friends, uh, actually two of my friends taking part in Dragon's Back two, two years ago were on a coaching programme from Missing Link. And I know the kind of nuts and bolts of that programme was um, lots of volume, but actually not that many big long runs. I mean, the runs were building up to the, you know, the 20, 30K plus mark, but it was lots and lots of doing that regularly was the core of it. And actually your whole weekly volume would would be quite high, but there weren't that many really long runs in the uh, in the program. Hey, but I'm not a I'm not a coach, so I shouldn't give coaching advice. Um, as I said, missing link coaching, um, raw adventure, and trail running Scotland for for some expert advice. Um, what I'm going to do now um, is ask you. Well, actually, Eleanor, was there any more training questions that would be relevant for now? Uh, any more training questions? Um, someone asked Ellie, coming from Lincolnshire, where it's particularly flat. Did you just rely on the recce trips, or did you go out into the mountains on other occasions? Um, I got to the Peak District quite a bit because that's my nearest sort of place where you can get some decent elevation in. Um, so I did, yeah, quite a few weekends there just like Edale skyline and things like that um yeah the recce weekends mainly the gl3d that was another chance to get in the mountains i'm trying to think what other trips and then although we are in lincolnshire and it is flat we do actually live on a hill so lots of hill reps basically um it's kind of, you know it's not enormous but it does seem to serve the, you know it did me good so yeah plenty of times up and down our local hill and um i kept in strength training strength sort of strength general strength and conditioning um all the way through which I think definitely you know really really helped even though I did have quite a few niggles and injuries I felt fairly well bulletproofed by um yeah just keeping in that strength training all the way through great great and um, we are if we don't answer any of the questions that have been posed we'll kind of do a bit of a round up at the end and try and pick up anything that we've missed um okay so Eleanor's keeping keeping tabs on that um excuse me so um what I'm going to ask next was if there's any bit of kit let's think about kit particularly that you were really happy that you took with you that kind of was useful you know I don't know that work something that worked well for you so Paul let's let's ask you first so Kate Rath Ultra kit um yeah, I mean, I suppose just um, like I said, there was a big choice about trainers, so that that is something that's very important because even even the trainers that I wore, uh, I'd done some decent big long runs in them, but they got to a point that they were causing me issues and stuff. So um, I'm not sure to change them, but um, it's that's definitely something to you know have tried and tested. Um, the um, having a good watch. Right. Certainly uh, made a big difference. Um, you know, Garmin Phoenix um, 6X is what I've, what I've used for it. And I hadn't even began to appreciate how good it was until the Cape Wrath. Uh, so, you know, all the map functions and things like that. Uh, one of the guys I was running with at one point said, he, looked, he just looked at his watch and then he said, so we've got about 100 metres to go on this climb. And I was like, Oh, he's really knowledgeable. How does he know that? And then it's like I didn't realise, you know, there's different you know menus that you could go through and it would actually show you if you've plotted the whole route, it will show you where you are in it, how many climbs there is to go, are you on a climb or a descent, and how much there is to go of that. Uh, and obviously then the map function where you're able to I mean, really, you know, at many points, uh, I mean, obviously you've got your actual physical map, which yeah. I did use sometimes, but mostly. You're just going along with your arm up like this, following, you know, because there's so many bits that are completely pathless. So definitely, watch was something I would have not, I would have not done without. Okay, okay, and Ellie, same question for you. Bit of kit that really stood out for you at the Dragon's Back. Oh, gosh, it's tricky. Uh, 
I mean, I don't know if we're going to talk about trainers again. Shall I mention trainers now? But <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm sure footwear always, you know, is a big hot topic, isn't it? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I just say try everything out, whatever you choose to take, just really test it out. So I had some new trainers which I tried out on the GL. Uh, three and it was I'd worn them previously on a recce in North Wales and they'd been fine and then it was very wet at, or one day was very wet on the GL3D and I was skating all over the place and yeah really glad that I tested them out and ditched those didn't take them to um, Dragon's Back so yeah just test everything out and the other thing that I suppose was really glad that I'd taken um, a fairly decent warm sleeping bag I sort of was struggling a bit for space in that um sausage you know sausage dry bag mm. and um I thought oh shall I go for a lighter weight sleeping bag but I was really glad because I think when you're really tired you feel the cold a bit more and um every night I was sort of had the shivers kind of felt a bit shivery and when I got into bed so yeah really glad that I didn't skimp on the sleeping bag took took the slightly warmer one that sounds um that sounds like good advice and I guess pretty similar question really but is there anything having done the event now that you would do differently with the kit like any, anything that stands out so paul put that question to you first um not really as as i said like with regards to the kit that i was wearing um i didn't need as much as what i what i'd taken everything that I, everything that i did wear on the first day worked really well so i ended up just going well why change it even just like silly things like you know you've Put your number onto like the shorts that I, that I was wearing. Did I could I really be bothered changing my sh the number in the shorts? Just keep it on. It worked. It worked the day before. So why so why mess it up? Um, so would I have done it? No. Uh, um, no, I don't think I would have really done anything. Okay. Well, apart from what I learned on on the way of things, but I. Uh, okay. And Ellie, same same question for you. Is there anything you'd like to have done differently? No, I was really happy with all my kit choices. I. I really given it quite a lot of thought about what I was going to want to wear in camp and oh the only, it's the only thing I didn't take that I wish I had taken I've taken compression leggings to put on in camp but I hadn't taken compression socks and my ankles and feet did swell up a lot so actually that would have been probably almost a better choice than the leggings really um so yeah that would be something I might take if I was to ever do it again <laughs> <laughs> Um, so there's a quite a good question that just flashed in. So Eleanor, I didn't quite read the whole question. Did you see it? Oh, uh, which one? The, the, About the hair. Yeah. Question for Ellie. What did you do with your hair during the event? Stuff it under a buff and ignore, put it in braids? <laughs> <laughs> um, I just, yeah, tied it up in a ponytail and left it for a week. Um, I only washed once or something a week. So um, yeah, I just left it as it was. It was nicely matted by the end of the week yeah i mean it kind of we joke about that but it is actually quite an important element of your mental preparation for the event is is the reality that um you know the, the facilities are basic you know washing is i think at the dragon's back we've got showers on day two and other than that it's you're in a river if you want to or a stream if you want to kind of clean off so being prepared for that, and particularly if you've got long, long hair, male or female long hair, it is something you want to think about. Um, yeah. Or beards, long beards as well. Somebody's mentioning the beard. <laughs> well, yeah, it's fine. I was, I just, I've had, I think because I'm slower, I had limited time at camp and washing wasn't really a priority. <laughs> so just do what you need to do to get basically, you know, clean enough to put your camp kit on and, yeah. um, and that'll do. So, we've um, moved nicely into to the camp life actually so um i think I, I think some people if you spend a lot of time in small tents in bad weather you you'll know how challenging it can be to to manage yourself and your kit in a in a tent and i think the reality and, and paul would have experienced this at cape wrath it rained every day for cape wrath and it was particularly challenging vintage this year so if if the participants potential participants just imagine our camp is packed up and moved every day so those um blue tents the communal tents that participants stay in they have to get rolled up and packed away to be transported so that means if they're wet they get rolled up wet so they get unrolled wet and then it rains all day so the tents 
you know, they get pretty wet. It, it is a challenging environment. Um, Paul, maybe you could talk about your experience of, of that. Yeah, I mean, you, we, we did just pretty much stay wet for the full time, uh, which was, you just ended up just getting getting used to it. Um, I suppose it did make it just a bit less enjoyable, the actual camp life, you know, if even if there'd been a wee bit of respite from it, uh, to be able to come back and sit out, put out some of your clothes and let them dry, but we just didn't really, just didn't really get that this year. Um, it was, uh, and it, it just meant that you were, more inclined to just um, stick on clothes and then just kind of hunker down. I know a lot of guys just ended up going to bed pretty early. Um, and, and sort of the problem there was that you, I find myself sometimes you'd just be sitting in the main big tent, you'd be chatting to people and you would just kind of huddle up and it kind of took away your hunger a wee bit. And you, you know, I had to kind of keep forcing myself to go, right, right, you need to move and get up and go out the tent and brace the rain to go to the food tent to actually get, get some food. So. Yeah, that was, and it, and it probably is something that I would say to people to, to doing it. I mean, it, the food is brilliant. And at first you're just like, wow, this is, there's so much and we can just keep eating and this is brilliant. But that's the reality of it is, if anybody knows, when you've done a big long run, you kind of go, oh, no, I don't actually feel that hungry. But yeah, just need to force yourself to, to keep going back up and filling yourself up. OK, so I think just for the benefit of everybody listening, um, the Cape Wrath Ultra this year was it was very unusual in that it did rain every day for eight days. Not not all the time every day, but for most days it rained most of the time. Um, and that's unusual. The previous editions we'd had almost well, the opposite experience with most days sunny and warm. So unfortunately, um, the 2022 edition will be remembered for, for those challenging conditions. Um, and based on that experience, we've introduced it at the Dragon's Back, and I think it's I think it's our intention to do the same at Cape Wrath, is to add in a drying room to the overnight camp so participants can actually dry wet kit, well, mo get it mostly dry. Um, but Ed, Ellie, let's, um, let's ask the same question to you about kind of your experiences of, of camp life. Um, yeah, it's just, it's, it's, you've got to stay focused. It's busy. Um, there's quite a lot to get done for me anyway in short amount of time um and like Paul said again with the food yeah I, I find eating quite quite a, a struggle it's quite it's you've got to force yourself to eat um the food is great but it, it is yeah it's it's quite hard to to make yourself eat when you're feeling that tired um and a bit kind of ugh. um but uh yeah it's just I found you just had to kind of keep go, keep focusing on what you needed to do because you can't, again I didn't have much time to hang around so it's sort of get in get changed get your bed I tended to get my bed out ready um, and then just yeah take the grab bag that had all my eating and my stuff for recharging and then and then yeah any dirty kit you want to have, try and do it as minimal trips back and forwards to the tent as you, as you could um, and then just go to the catering tent and kind of get your food and then hang out in the communal tent um, and then go to bed. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so I think I've seen a couple of questions fly in. I'm seeing them flash across the screen for half a second, but I think Eleanor will help me here. There's one about charging devices. Is that right? Yeah. So um, someone has asked, uh, let me find it. Um, how do you cope with charging devices at Cape Wrath? Is there some way you can charge them? OK, so um, what we have done, a bit of an innovation at the Dragon's Back this year, and we'll we'll take the same innovation to Cape Wrath next year and, and Dragon's Back as well, is to offer a charging tent. So this is banks of USB chargers that you can bring in a phone or a watch and you can charge them overnight. and. Uh, devices are left kind of it's, it's the space is supervised but they're still left at the participants risk um so you can either bring a power pack and charge stuff in your tent or you can um charge them through our and well, at our charging tent um and i think i saw another question about how late the catering was available for yeah i was actually just replying to that one okay so um at both the cape wrath and dragon's back the catering tent shuts um, at 10 p.m., which is the course closure time. So uh, uh, up until 10 p.m., uh, the full range of food is available. Um, however, if you do finish late, 
we will always have food available for you. And in reality, it takes the catering team about 90 minutes to wash down and clean up all the catering equipment from dinner service. So we have a microwave. Um, the, the catering tent is a full commercial kitchen, I should add. So there are there is a microwave in there. So we can see how many participants are still out on the course and we plate up food for them um, so that there is a full meal available for them when they finish. Um, and we do also have a very large supply of emergency dehydrated meals. So if something absolutely unforeseen happened and somebody finishes at three in the morning, um, we can uh, we can cover that. And I've just seen a question about celiacs. Are they covered? Yes, they are, is the simple answer to that. So I'm going to move on. Um, so uh, back to you, Paul. Um, what would your main bit of advice be for somebody who was considering taking part in Cape Wrath next year? Uh, it's really got to be down to training. Like, I think if, if it's something that you fancy doing, you know, really need to be honest with yourself. Uh, if you've maybe just in the last year progressed from doing sort of marathon distance trail runs to dabbling with a bit of ultras and think this is then the next step, well, it's, it's not, <laughs> you know, maybe sign up for the following year after that, because um, I think you need a good couple of years under your belt of doing really sort of back to back ultras. Um, uh, yeah, that would that's probably the biggest bit of advice. And then going back to trainers, because that's the next important thing <laughs> uh, is, is making sure that they are absolutely tried and tested um, because yeah, there, there was one point I was out on the course with a pair of shoes that I ran. I mean, a few weeks before I'd ran 100k in them, it felt fine. And suddenly, because you're going through all this pathless bog, running at a camber, things start digging in. And I found myself sitting down in a boggy marsh with a pen knife trying to cut out a part of a shoe that was digging in. So wow. just, just like that, you know, or uh, the 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 better you can start off with more comfortable shoes, the better. Yeah, I, I, I know from my personal experience of training that I normally get about 700 kilometres out of a pair of off-road running shoes until I've either trashed the uppers or trashed the soles. Um, and I always like to start a race having done at least 100k of training kilometres in them before I wear them for a long, long race. Um, so Ellie, so same same question to you is, um, what would your advice be to someone who was thinking about uh, Dragon's Back? Yeah, just get lots of long mountain days in. So mountain experience, I think, is probably more, yeah, probably more important than, run, you know, running experience in lots of ways. So just be comfortable on the terrain that you're going to be in. And it's quite varied on the Dragon's Back. So obviously the first day is quite technical, sort of more rocky, well, first couple of days, I suppose, and then it becomes a bit more traily, and then you've got all the tussocks and bogs and kind of that kind of terrain um of more of the sort of Brecon beacons area um yeah so just big long day long days getting your long getting your reckies or or it doesn't matter if it's not a recce if you're if you're um, but just get in get in the mountains and yeah get comfortable on that mountain terrain and with you know if you're not used to that and then also just handling yourself in in mountain you know all the weather that can be thrown at you just um you need to be able to look after yourself i think that's 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 the main thing, yeah. Okay, I think that sounds like good advice, and I, I'm going to pop some advice in from a from the race director perspective. And um, I've always been disappointed when I see runners come to the race and then something doesn't work out for them. And I saw a question. We're going to come back to this of what? Why do people, you know, fail to finish? And we'll go into that in a bit more detail in a moment. But you see people who they don't have the race they planned for and they expected um, and they just leave. Um, but actually, we've got the um, the hatchling course at the Dragon's Back race and the Explorer course at Cape Wrath Ultra as these are these are things we've always offered from day one. Um, but we've now given them a name. And what we do if you um, if you get injured or you time out, what something happens, you can actually drop down from the full course onto this um, shorter course there essentially the half days you might get you'll be inserted into the course at a certain point each day and um, these are still phenomenal challenges in their own right i think the cape wrath 
short course. The Explorer is 230 kilometres. I'm going from memory here, and I think the Dragon's Back Hatchling is 180. So these are pretty serious challenges anyway. And the participants that, you know, they just, they accept it, you know, something's not worked out, but they carry on on the, the, the Hatchling or the Explorer. They generally have a brilliant time because the pressure comes off. They've got more time in camp. Uh, they can really enjoy the camaraderie and the food and they get to have that experience of the journey. So my advice would be um, just have it in the back of your mind that there is a there is a really good plan B um, if the full course is not something that is going to happen for you on that occasion. Um, Eleanor, is there any relevant questions that you think should we bring in at this point? Um... So, I mean, I've got lots of questions. <laughs> well, sh shall we, maybe should we just fire through some questions here yeah. and we'll we'll maybe share them between the three of us who are, who cool. are talking. Um, so I've got one question that's come up a bit is, do you have any particular tactics for sleeping? Any tricks or tips with regards to that? Okay, so Paul and Ellie, let's ask Paul first, tips and tricks for sleeping. Um, earplugs. Uh, because generally there's movement happening near enough through the night, you know, whether it's people in the tent or just stuff that's happening outside. Um, so, yeah, your sort of usual camping sort of set up, earplugs, eye mask. Uh, and, and again, like I said, I would probably have invested a bit um, more uh, or, or taken more space in my bag for better sleeping bag, um, better pillow, uh, things like that, because... Yeah, I scrimped a wee bit on that for space so I could take more running kit, which I then didn't use. So, yeah, uh -huh. and, and we, were, we were faced with colder conditions. So you're going to bed feeling cold and wet and not. Well, for me, I wasn't really warming up. Right. OK, same question for Ellie then. Sleeping tips and yeah, tricks. I, um, yeah, I wish I'd had earplugs. So that was something perhaps I could take next time. Um, um, and yeah, take well for me. Uh, Take paracetamol before you go to bed. That was some a trip that somebody had said to me because I was quite you know sore and achy, and so if you can just get that in just before, you know sort of maybe ten minutes or whatever before you go to bed, um, kind of helps a little bit. But don't expect to to sleep brilliantly. <laughs> just <laughs> suck it up. <laughs> okay, Eleanor. Uh, can you give an indication of how much running versus speed walking you did? Okay, so um, Paul, you, uh, God, forgive me. You, you, I know you're quite near the front of Cape Wrath. What, what position were you? Eleventh. Uh, eleventh. Oh, I, okay. I thought you. Were, I was going to say eighth, but eleventh is good. Yes. It's very good indeed. So, and, and Ellie, I know you are further towards the back of Dragon's Back, but so you're going to have slightly different experiences here, which is great. So, Paul, why don't you share your experience of of running versus kind of ultra walking? Um, if, yeah, you, you come to the point where if it looks like even a bit of an incline, you go, oh, I'll just walk. Uh, so, and and I get it's, it's something that I find that uh, it's why I do less races now, because I actually find the competition can sometimes work. But if I'm just out by myself, then I feel there's no pressure to either run up or walk or others are walking. So maybe I should walk or something. So, um yeah, mostly, I mean, you, you get to the point, you're just, it would be silly to try and run up anything that's that's steeper, uh, you know, but if, it, if it's a bit undulating trail, and there are some really nice trails out on the Cape Wrath that you can just, you know, plod away on. So, I mean, I don't know if it was 50-50 or not, probably, probably okay. a bit, yeah. I think that's a really good bit of um, insight, actually, for someone who's done so well you know finishing 11th overall and actually you're doing quite a lot of walking um so um ellie why don't you share your kind yeah, of experience I mean, it's, it's interesting isn't it even to wherever you are in that in sort of in the pack i mean i i walked all the ups basically I, you know tried to but try to just keep going you know fast walking you know as fast as i could manage kind of on the ups and then ran all the flats and downs basically apart from for me on the last day because I was sort of injured by then I just walked the whole day on the last day as fast as I could kind of keep going to keep ahead of the cutoffs um but that was due to injury I you know would have, there was plenty more runnable sections on that last day but yeah I, yeah, I was just too, in too much pain by then 
Right. I think maybe I, I'll just add in as, as the kind of race organiser here that um, both Cape Wrath and Dragon's Back were, you know, created as running events. And if you wanted to finish the full course, um, you will definitely need to run at some point to be within those cutoffs. And certainly on Cape Wrath, there are some shorter days where you could just walk the whole day and you will get in on time. Um, Dragon's Back it is harder, although it has been done. And I think notably um, some of the older participants, but extremely experienced. Um, I'm thinking of Wendy Dodds and Joe Falconer have actually walked like power walks. They've set off early and they have not faffed. They're good navigators. They've got great mountain craft and they have just powered through using poles and they just about got in before the cutoffs each day. So it can be done, but goodness me, you need to be ruthlessly efficient to achieve that. Yeah, that um, is walking, definitely. It's not, yeah. not like average walking. Yeah, it's, it's power walking. Eleanor, what, what should we go next? Do you need good navigation skills to enter these races? Well, I think Paul's given us a bit of an insight already, but Paul, like, let, tell us about your navigational experience before Cape Wrath. Yeah, you, um, well, experience wise, I mean, I don't suppose I'd done anything where I, well, like I said, I hadn't even used my watch really for navigation. I'd used it to follow a route before, but not to actually find which way I was going in a, in an otherwise nondescript landscape. Um, so, yeah, I think you, yeah, you, you have to, you have to have like a good, um, sense of direction and, and an ability to follow a map, whether that's the map, the, the physical map or something you've got on your on your watch. Um, other than that, you would literally have to follow somebody in the hope that they're going the right way. <laughs> and, and, and a lot of times they're not. You know, you see people going away off and then you're looking going, oh, shit, they're going down. And then you see them further down, a couple of miles cutting back. So, yeah, you, you really... You, for the Cape Wrath, I'd say you you have to have a, a good sense of knowledge of um, actually you know navigating. Okay, okay. And Ellie, how what about your experience? Yeah, I mean, I, I think having recce it that really helped um, with the nav. But yeah, you definitely need to be able to get yourself out of a fix. I think because even using the the watch, you can go you know you can get off track, you can go wrong. Um, I did mostly just use the watch, but um, I wouldn't have wanted to, you know, not have been able to read a map. You definitely need you need both. You need to be able to use, you know, paper map and, um, yeah, and be able to correct yourself if you go wrong. That's that's the main thing because that's going to waste loads of time if you if you you know if you go way off. So yeah, yeah you need to know where you are. I think on the map. That's what I felt. I like. needed to know where I was on the map at all times. I think um again my observations from seeing well, hundreds of thousands of people doing these routes, is these events, is that you can take part as a relatively novice navigator who is relying on the GPX data on a phone or on a watch, and it is achievable to navigate, navigate the route like that. Um, but if you are a competent uh, map and compass navigator, that's definitely to your advantage. And the, the more experience you have with those traditional kind of mountain skills, navigational skills, the, the better off you are generally. Um, Eleanor, so. Uh, Lisa, we're just jumping on that because of follow up questions. Did you bring an additional handheld navigation GPS device? So um, the, the I'll just talk about the rules for a moment. So you, you need to have a watch and a phone that's mandatory kit and a traditional compass. And we issue the map to all the participants. Um, the rules don't state that your phone or watch has to be GPS enabled. But in reality, almost I'd say almost everybody has one or the other. Um, Paul, were you, did you have both or just one? Yeah, so I, I had both. I mean, I suppose if my watch had suddenly died, it I would have had to have thought and gone into my phone to find the right sort of maps and stuff that I, that I had saved, um, which I hadn't really practiced or thought about. You know, you just you just end up relying on on the watch. The watches are so good, but I guess they can go wrong. And um, I did have subsequent nightmares 
following the Cape Wrath of many things to do with Cape Wrath. One of them <laughs> was being out in the middle of nowhere and suddenly looking at my watch was dead. And I'm like, you know, yeah. Um, and, and Ellie, how about yourself? Yeah, no, just just the, the watch. Although I've also got OS maps on my phone, so I knew I kind of had that as a backup map. But um, no, I didn't. I didn't have anything else. OK, so I mean, maybe just a cautionary story to share with everybody at the Dragon's Back this year, the back marker on day one. So this was after we closed the course a little bit early because of uh, some thundery and lightning weather, bad weather coming through. And the very back marker who was left on the full course was navigating solely via a, a watch um, and they weren't an ex they, they weren't able to use a map and compass and the watch died and um, they essentially got marooned on the Snowdon horseshoe kind of feeling unsafe to to carry on navigating without without the aid of their watch so I guess that talk that kind of um, just highlights the fact that the, those digital devices are great right up until the point they they don't work so either a backup device or some experience with a map and compass is, de is definitely advantageous. Um, Eleanor will. Uh, we've had a few questions. What savoury foods did you eat on the hoof? OK, so Paul, savoury foods. Um, none, uh, which was my mistake. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there was, um, I think there was, there was, uh, so, so no, I, I just went on the basis of uh, bags for each day and most of them were just um, either energy gels, muesli bars, chocolate, things, you know, it was just highly calorific uh, sweets and stuff, you know, that that was pretty much it. Um, there was one point where, you know, people that have unfortunately dropped out along the way at uh, at the camp, you, you see this growing mound of stuff that has been f donated, which is great. And um, one of the days, can't remember which was, but uh, I went and had a look and uh, there was a, a packet of wraps and then a thing of peanut butter. And I was like, oh, me, you know, made that in the next day, having something like that out in the course. So, uh, yeah, the wraps or um, people would have like, you know, squeezy prim primula cheese or something like that in a, in a wrap. It, it's just something. And that that was a that was a, a, a lifesaver at that point, because you just your stomach just can't handle all that sugary yes. stuff along. Yeah. Um, so same question to Ellie, what was your savoury snacks? Yeah, in my run pack, I didn't have too much savoury stuff. That was more kind of, you know, like say muesli bars and flapjacks and whatnot. And then I did take some like salted nuts, tra trail mix um, and salted nuts for the run. And then I tended to have my savoury food in the drop bag for the dragon's back. So um, there I had more like things like oat cakes, mini um, crisps, um, mm baby bells and then I did um I think one day I had like a tuna pasta salad um sort of sachet thing um so which was really welcome and then obviously there's there is a chance to buy food in occasionally in on the did, way didn't you buy pork pie I did <laughs> famous <laughs> for my pork pie purchase <laughs> featured in our daily films yeah so yeah I tended to do savoury food not like on the run but on the stops or in the shops or whatever on the way yeah. I, so, something that I actually started using this year when I've been uh, out doing those longer runs is some um, supernatural, which is uh, they, they probably won't like me saying this, but it's um, like almost like a baby food, but um, like banana and date and sesame seed. And um, it's it's not really savoury, but it's definitely not sweet. But it, I found it really helps like settle my tummy when I've had a bit too much sugar and caffeine and um kind of one or two of those on those very very long runs has been it's been really good so Eleanor question where are we going next um how do you deal with wet feet all day great great question so Paul you definitely had wet feet all day at Cape Wrath this year um I mean I'm kind of used to it, so uh whether or not that makes a difference whether my feet are a bit more used to it I don't know but yeah I I'm quite used to it you know, what, doing the Cape Wrath at the end of May, I had in my head, end of May, usually we get some really great weather. And as you said, in years before it has been. Um, so it took me a few days to just adjust to going right. Pretend this is now actually, well, as, as the days went on, I was going, pretend this is just like April, pretend this is actually March, pretend this is actually 
January. That's <laughs> <laughs> what just kind of got into my head that it was, uh, this is more like a late winter expedition. Uh, you just, well, you just accept the, the soggy feet and stuff like that. There isn't anything you can do about it. You're going through rivers that are, you know, certainly over anything that would keep any water in uh, or water out. So, yeah, you just, you, you're going to get wet feet and that's it. Um, Ellie, how about yourself, your it experience? Wasn't, it, I think we were luckier on Dragon's Bike. It wasn't as wet, but it certainly did have good soggy feet on a good few days. I think just um, trying to get them dry as soon as you get into camp, that was my main thing, was like get your wet socks off, get your feet talked and dried, um, dry socks on. Then I put waterproof socks on over the top, so because I was wearing like sliders, you know, flip-flop type things around camp um, with waterproof socks. That seemed to work quite well, but, you know, I had dry feet underneath um yeah i didn't really i had a couple of kind of wrinkly wrinkly feet evenings you know but just tried to get them dry as, as soon as i could yeah i think um that the personal admin we mentioned earlier and part of part of it is just getting your food sorted out your tent sleeping space but also looking after your feet when you get into camp and i think uh, the waterproof socks and tolkien powder and drying your feet as soon as you finish is a uh, very popular approach and seems to, seems to work for a lot of people. Um, so I'm going to look over to the producer, Eleanor. Um, so this follows on for that. Um, someone said, I'd love to hear more about water crossings on Cape Wrath Ultra. Uh, any tips and did you practice for them? OK, so we'll ask Paul about that. What I will say first is that we provide some very specific advice to Cape Wrath Ultra participants because there is over 100 river crossings, river or stream crossings on the event. And uh, there's a whole load of information on the website. So if anyone is interested, just look at the guidance article on the Cape Wrath Ultra website. I'm about. posting it now. Ah, brilliant. Ellen's posting a link now. But Paul, go on. What, what was your approach to river crossings? Um, it's something that just didn't actually phase me. I didn't really think about it. I mean, we had all the talks at the start and you knew the severity about them and and you know what it's like if you go into a river that's fast flowing, the you know, you can feel the force of it. Um but it just uh, it just wasn't you know, you kind of had to get through them and you know you just take your time and I suppose you just can't feel what's going on underneath and that it's the only point because I didn't wear poles. I, I didn't use poles and it's the only point that I would say that People would have an advantage in, in going through the rivers. Um, but I saw some people that were just like stuck in the middle, not stuck, but just they got so scared, you know, they couldn't move any any further and just needed to help along. So um with stuff like that, although you do end up quite spread out, if you're if you wait by some people will come along and you can you can get helped, you know, form a wee chain just to go just to go through the rivers, because some of them were pretty uh, pretty full on this year. Yeah, there are some spicy river crossings, that's for sure. Um, Eleanor? Uh, what was the weight of your day pack and did you train with a similar weight pack? So, Eleanor, uh, sorry, Ellie. <laughs> Ellie and Eleanor, so I'm, I almost got through the session. Ellie, <laughs> do you want to tell us about whether you, um, what, how heavy was your rucksack and did you train with that weight? Yes, I'm not sure what it actually weighed, my run pack, because I wasn't you know it wasn't ever weighed for the the race particularly but yeah I just it was pretty much as I'd trained with it um I think um over the summer yeah I carried a bit more water so I'd got used to carrying the amount of water that was going to carry on on the event um because I think you know that's something that you can kind of forget to do um but yeah I carried I, I made sure that I tested out running with all the kit that you've got all the mandatory kit that you've got to carry and you know made sure it all fitted and everything worked okay um yeah took extra water bottles and that sort of thing okay but, and uh, uh so i don't think it was two liters of water i think i carried most days right okay and uh paul do you do you know how much your bag weighed uh no well i mean i suppose they that I'd, I'd say that question sounds a wee bit more like if you're doing you know one of these you know like the om or something like that where you're you're carrying all your camping stuff and everything like that, you, you start getting up to weights of closer to 10 kilograms, where it's quite noticeable, quite a weight in your back. This, I mean, you're really just taking what you need for the day and your spare layers and stuff. So it shouldn't really be any different to what you would practice with in training. Maybe some of the longer days, you've got a wee bit more um, 
fuel and energy, especially in the Cape Wrath, if you've not got you know the opportunity to fuel up along the way. So um, yeah, it shouldn't really be anything different to what you train with. Okay, I think I think that's quite an insightful comment. Actually, I think um, you know if you're already doing those long days in the hills, which is probably what you want to in the mountains, which is what you really want to be doing to prepare for these events. You've already got a pretty good idea of you know the the weight that you'll have and the kit that you'll carry with you. Um, Eleanor, we've got a question about poles. Obviously, Paul, you've already said you don't use them. Um, Ellie, did you use poles? If so, would you recommend any? Yes, I, it was something I've not done previously. You know, sort of this to this year's training, and I got poles about sort of probably halfway through um, the year, and um, yeah, so I did quite a bit of practice with them. I wouldn't say I'm you know brilliant at using them, but they definitely helped. I definitely found them a, a good support. Um, just even when it's really kind of um, those that tussocky stuff it can be quite hard going on your ankles and knees. So yeah, I found, I found them useful. And yeah, and for the long pulls uphill, definitely they were they definitely help me motor up the hills. Great. Uh, we've got a question aimed directly at Paul, which is: uh, You said you were surprised by the toughness of the terrain on Cape Wrath Ultra. In what way was that? Was it the elevation, the bogginess, or the rockiness? Um, none of that really. It was mostly the pathlessness of it. <laughs> you know, there's there's sections on runs where, like I said, a train in similar sort of um, environments in Scotland, but you you would never really plan to go out for like a fifty k run where like you've got sections up where there's ten k of like literally n no paths or anything because you know train runs are meant to be fun you kind of go oh that's a good route that somebody's done not like let's just you know go that way and see what happens uh so yeah that that was probably the surprise you know, the, the relentlessness of just going through nothing well amazing you know but you know the scenery was amazing but you're you're not following a path uh, for most of it yeah yeah so i think what i will do i will um there's a very a very detailed breakdown of the uh, path percentages on the Cape Wrath website. Um, I think Eleanor's racing to look right now, but what, before I get the actual numbers, I won't guess. When when the race itself is 400 kilometres long, you only need quite a small percentage to be on, you know, trackless terrain. And all of a sudden, like Paul has said, you get many kilometre after kilometre where there is very little. So what are the numbers then, Eleanor? It's uh, I can't find for the whole course. It's broken down for each day. Ah, OK, go on. Give us a give us like a day two. That's a tough day. Day two. That's through Neudart, one of the most exceptional days of the of the race. OK, so we've got. Um, sorry, here we go. So for pathless terrain, which one do you want to know first? Day, let's just do day two, but all, okay. all of them. Yeah. So trail is 63 percent. Track is 19 percent. Road is nine percent, and completely pathless is nine percent. Nine percent. So that the nine percent of the day two, that that is going to be many, many, many kilometres of well, nothing. Um, and I think Paul, everyone remembers day two at Cape Wrath Ultra. <laughs> um, okay, so let's have another question. Yep. Um, so we've got actually this question is probably more aimed at you, Shane. Um, Sorry, let me just get it up. My computer is not liking me at the moment. And Sorry. I've lost it. Uh, oh, what is the most common reason why participants don't finish the Dragon's Back or Cape Wrath Ultra? Are there any characteristics or obvious preparations shared by the successful participants? OK, so um, yeah, I can talk. I, I gen, so general observations from a decade of organising these two races now is that um, you don't actually need to be that fast to be successful. What you do need to be is disciplined um, and you need to have good personal admin. And that means, as Ellie's already talked about, you know, making sure you start at 6 a.m., you know, the earlier the earliest time if you want to have the maximum time out on the course. Um, it means good admin for sorting your feet out, um, eating well. Those are all all characteristics of people who finish. Um, what I would say is um, that the people who don't finish 
Um, some of them, the majority are just unlucky and they pick up, you know, an injury. But there's a definitely a significant minority who are overconfident and they start later than is advised. So for both events, we give you an advised start time from day two onwards, and that is based on your time the previous day. And it will it will suggest a half hour window when you should start the following day. Um, that information is based on an amalgamation of all the results and data from all the previous events. It tends to be super, super accurate. So if we say you should start at six or between six and six thirty and then you start at seven thirty, you're already on the back foot. And, and many of the people who get timed out start later than the recommended start time. So that would be my top tips. <laughs> um. So, Paul, you said you brought lots of fresh running clothes, but didn't use them. Mm -hmm. Ellie, what was your approach to running clothes? Did you have fresh ones each day? I had, I think I had four sets for the six days and I probably could have managed with three. Um, yeah, I'm not very keen on putting on sweaty leggings again the next day, but yeah, everything's so sort of mucky and wet anyway that it really doesn't matter but I did want to have sort of um clean kind of sports bra as as often as I could so um just because I think you, know, you get chafing and stuff if it's all salty and sweaty and horrible um so yeah so I, I managed with with yeah four for the six days four sets this is quite a fun question which probably aimed more at Shane but do you think there's a maximum age for participating um uh, I mean, there's there's no there's no maximum age in terms of entries. I think we've had some fairly older participants, certainly well into their 60s. Was um, oh my goodness me, um, there's the guy at Dragons Back this year, the um, Welsh guy who was 68. Yeah, 68. 68 who finished Dragons Back. So there's a measure. Wendy Dodds finished Dragons Back in 2012 when she was in her 60s. Um, so it's it's definitely possible when you're kind of perhaps might, people might say at the twilight of your running career to get these races done. You you just need to, I mean these particular people have got decades of experience, which definitely helps. But more than anything else, they have just got a rock solid attitude to getting it done and not faffing around. I would say, Eleanor. Um. Do you know any places in North Wales that might replicate similar terrain for the Cape Wrath Ultra? Again, you might be best place to answer that. So I think what I'm going to do just briefly is just talk a little bit about the differences of Cape Wrath versus Dragon's Back. So the Dragon's Back is about linking the, mount, the, the prominent mountain summits of Wales from north to south. So the, the race line, the natural route, links ridges and mountain tops and kind of it's it's craggy and it's high um, and I would say it is I think I saw a question earlier about which one was harder I would definitely say Dragon's Back is harder you've got more elevation um, the ground is rougher um, and then opposed to that op almost opposite to that Cape Wrath is about following the natural line through the Scottish glens and mountains so um, you know, you're generally in the bottoms of the valleys and going over passes. Excuse me. So the, the races are quite different in their kind of approach. Um, and what would be a good a good thing to do in Wales? So I'm going to make an absolute wild guess here. But on my radar as a little winter adventure in the next few months is to go and do the Slate Trail in North Wales which I think is about 100 miles, something like that. And I think it kind of it's a bit more of a journey through the Welsh mountains rather than visiting the summits. So that might be a really good uh, starting point. I think as we we're kind of almost 90 minutes in, so we'll maybe do one more question for, for Paul and Ellie. One left. Brilliant, one left. And then I've got a few little things to say to wrap up the um, the session. And um, so what was your single biggest challenge? over the multi-day events. Okay, so Paul, let's ask you first, single biggest challenge that you obviously overcome as a finisher? <laughs> um, it, it's it's gotta be finishing D6 because yes. it just, it was the, it was the build up of 
all the way there and everything. It was a it was a horrific day that just got worse and worse. Um I, and it was one of the longest days. It's the day that I know broke a lot of people, a lot of very experienced runners, um, either didn't make it or dropped out having made and finished day six. So and and it kind of filled you feel a dread with the next day to start day seven, which actually was one of my most enjoyable days. So it just uh, for, from being something that was uh, as a real low point to thinking, how am I going to carry on? Um, I guess that's the joy of ultra running and you know trail running is that you you go through these phases where you're right down at the bottom, not sure how you can carry on, but suddenly something happens and life's good again. <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. And Ellie, same question. Yeah, I guess similar experience, but for day five on Dragon's Back, which was, it, yeah, it just broke me. The wheels came off on day five and yeah, again, real low points. Um, and I suppose the thing I learned from that was that, yeah, you don't sort of don't give up until until you really have to, you know, until somebody tells you, right, you've, you know, you've missed the cutoff or whatever. Just keep going because you know you can surprise yourself and um yeah I was sort of annoyed with myself afterwards that I kind of get slightly mentally gave up on parts of day five and um yeah just yeah felt annoyed really because actually you know I still got in in time and probably could have got in with more time if I hadn't kind of gone oh I'm never gonna make it and you know felt a bit rubbish whereas actually yeah you can keep going it's kind of surprising Brilliant, brilliant. I think keep going is definitely the message to to take home here, isn't it? Um, I would like to say absolutely massive thanks to Paul and Ellie uh, for giving up their time to share their experiences with us tonight. Um, my colleague Eleanor, who has um, stayed late after work and has got a uh, you know a longer drive than me to get home, so thank you, Eleanor. Um, and I'd just like to say to all of the participants and potential participants, um, I hope you found that useful and, um, you know, informative. If you are interested in taking part or you've already already got an entry and you want to talk to us, send us a message. Um, you can phone us up. Uh, you can book a video call if you like. We're really happy to chat with you. Um, and um, we'd very much love to see you at one of our events and they are uh yeah they are exceptional experiences there's no doubt about it and there's something that will stay with you uh forever so thank you very much everybody um and hopefully see you at a at an event at some point soon all right good night thanks shane good night. Good night. Uh